Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neil. That would make me terrible, Troy. I'm Trista. And we're joined by Michael (laughs) Bailey Smith of A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, The Fantastic Four, Hills of Eyes, and a lot of cool stuff. And he has a really cool chainsaw we're going to see momentarily. (laughs) Yeah. It's very cool to have you here. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. And and beautiful lady, thank you Uh for... uh, inviting me i appreciate it i look forward to talking to you guys sharing some stories and all that good stuff we, we look forward to it too and uh first of all yeah. happy uh, veterans day thank you sir i appreciate that i was in the 82nd airborne for about uh, three years and uh that was good yeah so yeah yeah i read thank that you. you uh went to you went to high school in in, in iran i did in uh iran yes so Iran. So I went there. My dad was in the Air Force and state. And so we I don't really have a hometown. Uh, I've, you know, so say, hey, where are you from? Uh, I was born in Michigan, but that's about it. And so uh, but I've lived all over and ended up graduating high school in the Middle East in Iran and at the U.S. Embassy where they held the hostages. And my superintendent became one of the 50 American hostages. So. Pretty crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, early on and then what, what I, I read that, um, like you didn't pursue acting necessarily, like you happened to be with a friend. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, so I joined the military first, let's back up a little. So I joined the military. Uh, so I wanted to play college football. That's my goal. When I, uh, believe it or not in Iran there, we played American football. So the high school was, it was Toronto American school is big enough to have three high schools. Plus there was a community school that had Americans and Iranians and they had high school too. So we, basically played each team, you know, twice. So he had a pretty good season, right? Eight games or so. And so it was, uh, it was pretty nice. And, uh, and so, but when I got done, I made the all-star team, uh, that really means anything, but I did. And when I got done with that game, uh, I got, I played really well and made this interception and almost won the game and all this other stuff. But at the end, this coach come up to me and said, Hey, you know, you're good enough to play college football. And it's something I've always wanted to do. So uh, I said, well, you know, my dad was in the Air Force and the sergeant's pay when I'm the oldest of six kids. Well, guess what? You're, they're not going to be affording to send me to college. Right. And there's no scouts going to be scouting me in Iran, you know, to get a, a college offer. Right. So I said, well, how, how can I do this? And so I joined the Army and uh, I want to do something kind of hardcore. I first wanted to be an Army Ranger. And they said I was too skinny. I was six, four and 160 pounds. So a pretty skinny dude. And so I said, well, what's the next best thing? We'll be in the 82nd Airborne as a paratrooper. So that's what I did. And, but what the goal was to get out and to play college football. So, but I, when I was in the chaplain of my unit, chaplain Gimble, he was an all American at uh, Kansas state before he went to seminary school. And so he said, Hey, I hear you want to be a play football. I said, yeah. So let me make some calls. And so he, about a month later, he calls me, calls me in his office. goes, Corporal Smith, guess what? I got to, I got Notre Dame. They want to, they want to see you. They, they, you know, they want you. And I'm like, okay. I, I had no idea what that meant really. You know, what, it could have been, you know, Joe Bob's University in Notre Dame. I, I, yeah, I knew who they were, but didn't know the gravity of how big they were. And then right before I got out, he says, um, where are you from? And I said, well, I was born in Michigan. He goes, well, let me, let me look in the paper. He says, well, it looks like Eastern Michigan needs some help. They haven't won a game in a year. So uh, he called them and they said, yeah, well, you know, we'll take a look at him. So I, I uh, went there and stood in the hallway and ready to meet the head coach and when I walked, when I was all prepared to tell him, hey, I'm going to play tight end and defensive end. And the O-line coach walks by and says, hey, you that paratrooper? And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, I need a center. You want to play center? I said, I'll play anything, sir. And next thing you know, that's how I started. I started, I played center, went from there to guard, tackle. And then I got enough uh, recognition. And I went to the Dallas Cowboys and played there for a little while. And then I blew my knee out in camp and went back and finished my degree. Then met some crazy gal. Uh, and then we went to California and that's where I ended up in San Diego. And, uh, that relationship lasts about a month. And, uh, then I befriended this guy named Steve Henneberry, who was, he was a uh, Conan in Conan, the adventurer show up in universal studios. If you've been up there, they have these live action shows. Right. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he says, Hey, I'm going to go up to Los Angeles to read for this movie called nightmare on Elm street part five. Why don't you come with me? Maybe you can audition and then we'll go to gold's gym after and in Venice, you know, the Mecca of bodybuilding. And I was in the bodybuilding at the time. And so I went up there and he did his thing. He read, did whatever. And then 
they asked me if I wanted to come in. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go in there. I had no clue. Right. So I met uh, Stephen Hopkins, this uh, director, pretty well known after that. He's like, so Michael, have you seen other Freddy Krueger movies? And I said, of course. And he says, all right, we need a big guy. They could just laugh. You know, so I laughed this big freaking laugh. He goes, that's Evan Olsen. Guess what? You got yourself a job. <laughs> I'm like, well, wait a minute. I, uh, I work at Xerox. You know, I'm debugging software. And he goes, well, you have to take a few weeks off. And that's what I did. The moment I got on the set, well, first of all, it was so cool. I, I show up and Robert England's there and they, the director said, hey, well, go talk to Robert England about playing you know, Freddy Krueger. So I sat in this trailer. He was the coolest dude ever. If he was, if he turned out to be a, like a, you know, an a asshole or, you know, just a jerk, I would have went, I don't want to do this, meaning be an actor. You know, yeah. it's all filled with a bunch of weirdos and egomaniacs, but he was so cool and just really nice. And he, we talked about, uh, you know, Freddy Krueger and he talked about what, you know, what super Freddy would look like and do and things like that. And so, you know, they, they put the, they fitted the prosthetics. I mean, they had to add a few more pieces because I got a big head and then uh, compared to his and they made the glove and the hat and the outfit. And next thing you know, I was on a set going faster than a bastard maniac. <laughs> Did that whole situation, you know, they had a couple of lines of dialogue and I got my SAG card. I'm like, yeah, man, this is easy. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so, but I, you know, uh, yeah. So the funny story is that, Right after that, I thought, yeah, this is easy. I could do, you know, I could do this. So I went to a went to a commercial audition after that, like a few weeks later after I did that movie. And uh, I went in and read and the cast director goes, so, uh, Michael, do you have a day job? I go, yeah. I said, I work at this uh, computer test laboratory. You know, I have my degrees in computer science and I'm debugging software. And he goes, that's great. You probably should keep that job. Wow. And I walked out going, she's kind of nice. Wait a minute. She just freaking <laughs> insulted me. Yeah. You're freaking kidding me. I was pissed. And so that, so if you don't know anything about me, that's one thing. If you tell me, no, you tell me that I suck. Guess what? I'm coming back after you. I will prove to you that I can do it. Or I'll prove to you that I'm going to be great at this. And that's what happened. I not saying that I was great. I just say that I could, you know, and so I studied my ass off. I went to, I went to, I did scene study, cold reading, improv, audition techniques. I did theater. I did everything possible to learn the, the craft of acting, uh, the business, the whole side of it. Auditioning for uh, auditioning is totally different than actually doing the job. There's parts of it that are the same, but it's still, you know, it's it's crazy. It's a, it's a crazy world. So, but I got good at it. You know, I got good enough to where there's other big guys like me that just walked in and went, "I'm a big guy. I don't need to. I don't need to study." Where I came in and I studied. You know, and I worked the scene a lot of times before I went in. I came in hot, meaning I came in ready to go, and I crushed it. Um, most people, you know, will maybe book one gig out of like maybe 20 or 30 or 50 auditions. I did probably, probably three out of 10, four out of 10. I, my booking ratio was really high. And that's why I worked all the time. I've done like 60 films, 100 episodes of television, tons of commercials and video games and voiceovers and, you know, all that stuff. And just, I'm just totally blessed, but it didn't happen without a lot of hard work, you know, mm -hmm. and I got to work with some great people. I did some cool ass movies, man. I could, I got the, I got to play uh, Freddy Krueger, which is freaking awesome. You yeah, know, I got, a, not I got many people who say that. I think I got people with tattoos of me on their body. Come on. I got an action figure. I know the action I mean, figure is pretty sweet. too. Though. Yeah. So all that stuff man. It's so it's so I'm so blessed. I just am. You know, I've had a I had a fun ride. I really did. And uh, it was good. It was good, yeah. man. When your friend uh, when he went in for the audition, did he audition for Super Freddy or was he auditioning for a different part? No, he was auditioning the same thing. So, you know, yeah. So probably a little bit of, uh, huh, you know, going on. But yeah, uh, no, just, it was cool. Were you still friends cool. after that? or was, it Yeah, was of course. We still are. Yeah. He, you know, he uh, he, he went on and did a, 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 a series and he was American Gladiator guy. You know, he oh, has, nice. he's had a lot of success. Now he's a millionaire. He sells real estate. You know, he's, he still competes in bodybuilding. He and I both uh, competed a little bit so together, but he's he's a big dude. So, yeah. yeah. So um, you say, you know, you get super Freddy and part of you thinks, oh, I can do this. This is easy. Then you realize it's not so easy and you start to study. <laughs> uh, when do you when do you in your mind, when do you think uh, when do you get like passion for acting? Not just like this is something I want to do. This is something like I, re I really want to pursue. Well, when when I did when I. Nightmare on Elm Street, being on the set, 
and it reminded me of a lot of football. I'm I'm a very physical guy. I I love I love I love getting in fights. I don't do that anymore, of course, but I love getting hit in the face. I I, I that's what I liked about football. It's the only time you could beat the crap out of somebody, and it was legal. It was great. <laughs> it was fun. I could hit the literally the living shit out of people, and people loved it. It was awesome. You know, and then, um, but I also like the fact that it was fourth and inches and some dude across me, some all American saying he's going to kill me, my future wife and my kids. And I'm going to kick your ass. I'm like, oh yeah, we'll see about that. And then they go freaking, I destroy him. Acting was the same way, not in the physical sense, but in the sense of action, you got to perform. There's thousands of, sometimes millions of dollars riding on you performing. And I love that kind of pressure. I love that. And it's funny I, love, I think the best, and I, I grew into loving becoming an actor and, and characters and developing characters and, and really thinking uh, my whole mindset of it. When I get on a set, especially if I'm doing a movie in a location, um, I become that character to a certain extent. I mean, when I did The Hills of Eyes, uh, uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron Stanford, who played Doug on Hills of Eyes, um, I, dude, I wouldn't talk. He wouldn't talk to me and I wouldn't talk to him. We were enemies, you know, after, you know, we had a beer and yeah. things like that, but it's beginning, man. And I really wanted to freaking hurt that guy. I mean, I, of course, all in the control, but that's the thing. I love playing that character. I love those kind of characters uh, where you can just sink your, yourself into it and you can let go. It's very cathartic to be able to, you know, like, like the Pluto character where you become just an innocent guy holding that baby, you know, <laughs> you know, doing all that, then going from that to freaking running through a wall and trying to kill everybody. What a, what a great, what a great time. Who else can do that? Really? Pretty. So I just, I just grew to love the loving building characters and becoming that character. When I first started, I hated playing dumb guys. I, you know, and then because I always felt that, oh, you're, you're going to think I'm a dumb person, you know, then I'm like, that's so stupid. Because it's a character, and then I just loved it. I loved all that, and I and it's it's been a it was a blessing for sure. Yeah. When you play a character like that, do you try to uh, even if it's even if it's not necessary in the script, try to find like the humanity or or, or something about the character yeah. other than just he's like the the big kind of dumb guy. Yeah, no, I have. Um, yeah, so you, you'll see like in the, like in Hills of Eyes, there, you know, some of the emotions. You know, working with KMB you know, uh, who was the makeup effects people for um, Hills of Eyes and Hills of Eyes 2 that I did. Uh, they, the way they applied the prosthetics really allowed me to act, you know, and show that physical, you know, the emotion, the physical portion of, of showing emotion on your face and things like that. So uh, yeah, there was, you, you know, you want to do that. And that's one thing I, Alex uh, Aja uh, said, that you know, I could really show that kind of emotion. So uh, he said I was probably one of the best bad guys you know out there in Hollywood at the time. So and I love playing bad guy because I'm not a bad guy in real life. You know, I'm just a nice kind of a cool dude. You know, if you step on my toe, I might say something, but <laughs> other than that, you know. Yeah. You know, so how do you so approach how do you approach playing the villain? Do you look at them as, as the villain, or do you try to find? No. Uh, so the the, the key and the mind. secret. It, no, yeah. the, the key and the secret is first is to you. You have to you have to believe that what you're doing is the right thing. So even like Jeffrey Dahmer or whoever, all those guys didn't think they were doing bad things. They didn't. They thought they were on. They had to. They had a purpose of why they were doing this. So you. So when you're when you're playing a bad guy, you have to have a mission, a person. So I do a lot of writing, right? So right now I set a screenplay options to go into production next year. Um, but my 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 bad guys have a a purpose they have a mission they think they believe that what they're doing is the right thing and they have to to complete that mission so um that's that's what happens i mean you know any any mass murder any you know dictator out there all the same thing right they all think that they're they have a mission they want to do something right that's what mm -hmm. they, for their quote greater good even though it might be evil so yeah. that's that's how you approach a role uh trust do you have a question do you have any advice for someone who might aspire to a similar career as your own? Uh, advice as towards starting or if you're already in it or what do you think? Like, like, what do you I, think? Either one applicable. Anything you want to share for people? I mean, you've had, um, 
you know, you can really testify uh, about or to longevity in a business that's really yeah. tricky to uh, yep. manifest that. So maybe you could talk on that. Yeah, so uh, so I I have actually helped people get into the business, you know, and, and uh, several of those people are, are to this day still working in, as actors. And they've, they've come to me when they were like in some other state, not in living in Hollywood, right? Um, and so I, the first thing I tell people is that you really need to want to do this. Um, not just go there and just say, I'm going to try it for a couple months. It doesn't work like that. Or I want to try it for a year. You have to go there. Think you have to go there with a the mindset. I'm going to be successful. And that's how you approach life. That's how you do anything in life is the same way. You not, you know, if you're going to do something, that's, that's, you have, you have that mindset that I'm going to be successful at this. And now I'm going to find my way to make that happen. So living in Hollywood or living in Los Angeles is expensive. And so waiting tables um, is, is, well, it, it's fine, but you need to find a job first, right? That pays well, that allows, that pays you well enough for you to get a, a decent place to live and, yeah, and have some money in your pocket. Uh, someone told me this a long time ago is that even though you might be broke, but you don't act like you're broke. That means you don't spend the money, but you got you to gotta dress nice. You got to you know, have a decent car to drive and have the attitude that you're not broke. And as an actor, most actors are broke. They are. I was for when I first started, but I was fortunate enough to, to, to grow into there's a percentage of income that you can make as an actor. And I was in a seven, seven percentile of all actors was making money. So that's, that's, that's a rarity. Right. And that's from a, some dumb kid, you know, that's, that, uh, you know, finished playing football and kind of happened by accident, but then I formulated a plan. And the first thing to do is that get yourself a job, find yourself a place to stay that's safe, right. Make sure you have a car. And then from there, get your butt in acting classes. I don't care what you're taking, get your butt in acting class and start networking. Start talking to other actors. Who's your manager? Who's your agent? What else, what are you guys are doing? Get on things like backstage. Start answering those ads. Go to the local universities like UCLA and, and USC, which I did, and sign up to be an actor in their student films. And I've done some really cool films that no one ever saw that were, you know, I was a star in these films. It was cool. And that's how you get your cut your teeth. You do things that are non-union. You do all these things like that. Maybe I always say try to stay away from extra work just or, you know, background stuff just because, first of all, everybody needs background actors because just the actors stand in their principal actor. It would be really boring just to watch that, right? But the thing that's important is that some you want to make sure because you have to have the mindset of being a star, right? Being that you're worthy to, to be the lead in a, in a film. And so... Um, um, I get emotional when I start talking about some of this stuff. My nose starts running, my eyes get all watery. But um, but that's what you need to do is stay kind of stay away from that stuff and and do those things and work your way. Find yourself an agent, find yourself a manager, and that's and know that it's a process. And it's going to take time. And there's all these they always talk about. Oh, he's an overnight overnight success. Well, you know what? Really, he's probably been there five or six, ten years, and then he was then he got something right, and that's kind of what happened. So. Um, that's my, that's my suggestion to anyone that starts get a job, find a place to stay, make sure you have a car that works all the time and then get to acting class, start networking and then start doing these things and start building your resume. That's how you do it. It's not going to happen overnight. Sometimes it does for some people, they might discover you, you know, but then, but most of the time it's just going to take hard grunt work to make it happen. And I have a cat who's going to be walking across my my screen oh, here we're surely happy to have uh to have pets uh, make their appearance here on the show yeah so it's yeah, yeah i see him anyway you guys maybe he wants to sit on my lap so i'm doing that next oh that's very cute see Hello. the tail it's <laughs> always our favorite guest stars yeah <laughs> what's the yeah, cat's he's a great name cat. he's a great cat we uh we got him as a rescue as a kitten and he's the coolest dude same's uh dash because he just goes gotta go Whoosh, and he's gone <laughs> so that's how he is so let me hear him show him to you right here. Here he is. Here's my guy. Oh, hi, Dad. <laughs> He's very handsome. Yeah. He is very handsome. He's a good, crazy dude. He's <laughs> fell in our pool twice. Uh, my wife my wife says, you know, you got nine lives, and uh, he's used up a couple already. So he's got a few left. 
but the only thing is that he wakes up at four in the morning. Hey, dude, I'm hungry. Go give me some treats. So <laughs> yeah. I want to sleep. So it's good, dude. Did you have anybody uh, when you broke into into the business who uh, helped you with advice or was a mentor at all? Um, you know, I think Steve Hedenberry was already in the business a little bit, so that, I think that helped a little bit. But then I I knew we were good friends, but there was competition there because they're the same. And I wanted to do he wanted to do something else. He wanted to be like uh, more of a celebrity. I wanted to be an actor. And that was the difference. And so I separated myself and I didn't really have anybody help me. I, you know, I'd made mistakes. Um, I remember, you know, uh, answering an ad in the paper, uh, you know, hey, get headshots, whatever. And I wasted like 500 bucks on headshots that were terrible. Then I talked to people. The best thing to do is go to an acting class and network. I'm telling you right now. Because there's actors already there doing it and doing whatever and making it. And then you can talk to them, you know. And then I got hooked up with a, a guy named Michael Helms, who was a great photographer. Um, and he got me great pictures. And that's kind of whole thing, how the whole thing started. And I mean, that's towards getting pictures, learning about how to put your resume on there. Um, yeah, I, I even for them, I got this manager, an agent, and I hustled for him. So Back in the day in the 90s, they didn't have this all done electronically. They didn't have a cell phone back then, right? So nothing. You had a pager, right? And so um, I would go and drop submission packages off at all these casting director places. I'd get up like at 6 o'clock in the morning and go drive around Hollywood in my car and drop it off. Pack. I hustled, man. This is what you got to do. You just got to do it. This stuff's not going to happen like just in your lap. You just got to hustle. It's like anything you do in life. Like, right. So that's what you got to do. But the goal is really study your ass off and be so freaking good as an actor that when you walk in, they go, holy shit, I want to hire you. You're freaking awesome. That's what you want. And that's the attitude you have. Same when I played football. I wanted to walk when I walk on the field. I want to be so badass that 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 they're going, holy shit, we want this guy. The same thing I'm writing now. I've been written, I've written a ton of screenplays. This last one's really good. And it's, it gets got option. It's going to go into production next year. I want my goals to write it so good. I made some stars so good. So well, such a great story and great character. People go, Oh my gosh, I want to make this. And that's what happened. So, and that's the kind of attitude you have to have. That's in, like in life in general, you, you mm -hmm. get your, you have a, I don't care if you're working at freaking McDonald's. It don't matter. Be the freaking best server in freaking McDonald's. And next thing you know, you're the manager. Next thing you know, they may go, hey, you know what? You should own some franchises. Next thing you know, you own a couple of McDonald's, then six of them, then 10 of them, and 20 of them. That's what happens. I get crazy about this. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. I, I like to see uh, the passion. And um, um, I, I don't mean this that you have an ego at all, but I, what I was going to say is I think you also, you have to have a certain amount of self-confidence to make it in, in anything. Yeah, I agree. But as an actor, trust me, what goes on the outside is not a lot that happens on the inside. The outside, you got to act like you're confident. You walk in, you own the world. But inside, you can be like, "Wow, well, I'm, you know, I suck." <laughs> and right. I always think, and I always think that I suck. I, I never think I'm good. I and that and 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 what that, it's, it's a, yin and yin, It's bad and good because mm -hmm. I'm killing myself. But then also, it makes me want to work harder. So, yeah, and that's kind of how it is. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned, you know, Super Freddy, people have tattoos and the action figure. That's, you know, more recent, like years later. Uh, yeah. When did you know that this was a, like a character that, pe that really stuck with people? I, I, I didn't. Uh, not for a long time and probably till. I, I don't know. I just, you know, I, you know, I had like a, I had like four lines in the movie in my first four lines, right. Or three lines faster than a bastard maniac, more powerful than a local madman. It's super bad. <laughs> you know, the whole situation. Um, okay. That was it. So I, you know, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I bragged about it. Hey, I did this movie, da, da, da. you know, I was talking about it. It's like, this was kind of cool. And, uh, but I didn't really know it was going to be the, uh, that big of a thing till later on, especially I think, when sometimes it, film, films get older, you know, they become more of a, you know, nostalgic and classics, cult classics and things like that. So, like, you know, you guys ever watched a movie called Monster Man? I've seen that you're in it. I've not seen it, though. Come on, man. You got to watch that. 
I play I a character named Fuckface. I no. play a character named Fuckface. Come on, how can you? How can you not watch? <laughs> now a I have to. Fuckface? Yeah, now we're gonna look it up. So look it up. It's uh, <laughs> a guy named uh, Michael. Uh, last name director, great guy. Uh, shoot, he did a movie called Shoot 'Em Up, uh, Bang Bang Shoot 'Em Up. I think something like that. After, but great guy. Um, I play a character. This is a great character. This is the only time that I auditioned for something where I auditioned for, and the director got up and hugged me. Oh, really? Because you got the role. You're 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 done. I don't see anybody else. You're perfect. So it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. But where where do you know where like people can uh can find it? It's, it's kind of hard, but yeah, yeah, go search, you know, and you'll you'll find copies of it. Um, but yeah, not too bad. I will, I will check that out definitely. I hope everyone else does too. So, uh, how did you get the role of Ben Grimm, the thing in the Fantastic Four? Oh, look at the awards. Is that what this you won the award for? Fuse Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. That is very cool. So, I beat out I the love Rock that. for nice. best fight scene, and I beat out King Kong and uh, T Rex and somebody else. Oh, the uh, Kate Black Beckinsale. I beat oh, her wow. out. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, so what are we talking about? Um, well, we'll get. Well, well, how about the the award? We'll talk about that. That's pretty sweet, and it yeah, seems yeah. like it's very heavy. You were telling us about before. It is. It's 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 actually made of true cinder block. It's like probably weighs like freaking twenty pounds, thirty pounds. Ah. That's a real chainsaw. It's kind of dulled down, so it doesn't hurt anything. But yeah, it's uh, and it has if you can see there, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Nice. Fuse oh, it's totally badass. 2016. Oh, it's, it's really cool. It's got felt on the bottom of it. It's pretty nice. Yeah. So it's good. Um, it's funny. They called me like uh, the producers of that show called me like a couple weeks before. Go, hey, uh, you're gonna come to the. You come to this, right? I said, yeah, I'll come. Go, hey, good. And then uh, somebody else calls me. You guys, you're coming to this, right? I said, yeah, I'm coming. And another person, you sure you're coming? I said, yeah, I'm coming. And so I get there and they put me in a seat, you know, with a star on it. And then I'm like with my appearance manager, uh, I think it was Bill Philput, it's a guy. And uh, at the time, I said, oh, looks like you got a star. I said, I don't know what that means, but whatever. So they had me sitting on like the edge. And it's funny when you're clapping and there's a camera like right here on you, you're like so self-conscious. Like, do I go, you know, make a goofy face or whatever, you know? I learned something too about the red carpet. Um, and that is, when you go down the red carpet, like I'm the first one I went to, I forgot m- movie I did on the red carpet. I was making like, hey, how you doing? You know, making all these. Then all of a sudden those pictures show up. Oh, holy crap, I look like a freaking idiot. So then after that, I said, okay, I have to do some acting here. So I was like, you know, all serious and doing the poses. And, and then I was cool. But it's a whole thing going on with that. You just don't know, you know. So pretty crazy. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So I was asking about how, how you got the role of Bed Grimm, the thing in uh, the Fantastic oh, Four. Yeah. So that was just, um, you know, I, I just started acting. I did, uh, I did, uh, I did, uh, Fen- uh, what do you call it? Nightmare Down Street. And then I did, um, I did a book to TV show called Renegade. Remember that show, Renegade with yeah. Lorenzo Lamas? And so I was doing that show, and then the my manager goes, hey, you have an audition for this movie called Fantastic Four. I'm like, is that a comic book? And they go, yeah. And so I was in San Diego, so I drove up during the weekend and on Saturday, and they read me. And when they read me, uh, they go, wait, wait, wait one minute. And you always know when so, they say something like that, something's good happening. All of a sudden, they start bringing in these other people in the audience. They go, okay, read again. <laughs> all right good thank you and then i walked away and then i'm like i think i might get this and so then like uh this is like in december so then um a week later they go yeah you got the role and we we and so it was great played i played ben Grimm. uh a good friend of mine named carl chifalio a uh, famous stunt guy he played the he was in the thing suit mm-hmm. so i wanted to be in that be, you know i'm a physical guy but they, because the uh, the suit takes a long time to make they started that like six months in advance or whatever how many months in advance so but yeah it's good stuff those are like my first uh like kind of good film and good character and that character is a lot like me as towards, i was thinking uh, that when i was talking to you because he's on the outside he's you know people might think he's just like a lughead but he's an intellectual guy well i'm about well, thank you if you think i'm intellectual I, i'm really <laughs> fooling you pretty good here so <laughs> So I just have fun, man. That's all you do, right? So yeah. it's sometimes it's too too uh life's way too short to uh, uh to be too serious. So it's all good. 
What was it like, though? Because, you know, famously, the movie doesn't get released. It has been released uh, the last few years, but at the time it yeah. didn't get released. Yeah. So disappointing. You know, um, so I remember uh, when we we didn't actors didn't the the cast didn't know and neither did the director know that it was going to be shelved. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we finished the film, everything was good. And then they did like a trailer for it. Right. Yeah. It was a trailer that actually showed in movie theaters, but they yeah. um, they did a trailer for it. And then they said, hey, uh, how about the cast show up at the Shrine Auditorium or uh, there's a, a big convention there, a uh, signing convention, a comic book convention. And they played the trailer for the Fantastic Four. Before they played it, there was a line out the door and down the street and around the corner to line up to go see this. And then I turned to Alex Hyde White, who played Reed Richards in the film, and I said, I think we got something here. And he goes, yeah, let's let's do something. So <laughs> he and I started working together and I paid out of my own pocket about 15,000 bucks, something like that, 12,000 for a publicist. And we started promoting the film. We went to all these different comic book festivals and conventions and comic book stores. And I even had the trailer, v VHS a trailer and I and we were flying back from Florida and I, I asked this, the flight attendant, could you put, because back in the day, you, they would put these VHSs in the, and you'd yeah. watch a movie. I said, "Can you put the, can you put the Fantastic Four trailer in there?" So she did, and the whole plane watched the trailer and cheered. It was kind of cool. And yeah. then so we were all it was it was getting ready to be released. We had a premiere set up at in uh, in Min the Mall of America in Minneapolis. Well, we had Ronald McDonald House. Uh, we had a Children's Miracle Network, all uh, uh, local and national radio and television affiliates were all tied in. Everybody was going to come. And then right before Christmas, uh, we got a notice saying cease and desist. The rights have been sold to the 20th century. So that's what happened. Yeah, and the um, the documentary came out a few years ago, Doom, which I yeah, thought yeah. was great. And uh, you go back and look at our archives for people. I had the director on and Jay Underwood and uh, oh. Joseph Culp, who played uh, Dr. Doom on. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, it was really emotional because it talked a lot about you specifically using some of your own money to get the the word yeah. out there. Yeah. And then, um, and according to the documentary, like uh, a lot of the people, you're not yourself or the cast or the director, but a lot of people like knew going into the movie that it, they were just making for some weird to keep the rights, but the, like they knew going in, like they weren't going to actually release the movie. Look, not the cast, but uh, right, but the, the actually, uh, yeah. Bernard Eichlinger was the the guy, and I think Roger Corman from uh, you know Corman, uh, you know the, the Corman Studios things. I think he knew something was up to a certain extent, you know. But for us, the cast, we didn't know. Yeah. We didn't know, and so, but you know, Oli Sassone, who was a director, did a phenomenal job with the money they had, and he did a basically a clandestine type of a operation and edited it you know behind the scenes and got the whole thing got an orchestra which is phenomenal and, and that music is still great to this day the fantastic four yeah. i mean yeah that movie came out at the same time as jurassic park right, right. so compare you know millions of multi-million dollar whatever 100 million dollars for that film and then less than a million dollars with fantastic four as towards visual effects and that's what you get right so but budget aside, I'm not just because you're here. I I honestly think it's it's the best uh, version of Fantastic Four of uh, the films. Yes, it's thank the most you. fun, and, and I think it's yeah, the it's the closest to the, to the comic. Yeah, I, it is. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, um, and it's funny. I've been asked a few times, uh, "Have you seen the newer ones?" And I go, "I might have seen like maybe a few seconds of it, but you know what? It's kind of like." cheating on your wife not gonna do it <laughs> and so there you go yeah and uh um normally i would be against you know bootlegs and stuff but uh that was a movie that wasn't released so it actually had a lot of bootlegs out there and then eventually it did get uh, a release just i think right after doom came out they released yeah it. Yeah. That's how I found it was on like a bootleg at a comic book convention. Yeah, I don't imagine. I've been yeah, looking that, forward. It was the year I graduated, know, 94. And I remember I was just years, he, bought yeah. the, uh, he bought the VHS yeah. yeah. at a comic yeah. in Boston. Yeah. You graduated in high school in 94? Yeah. I mean, wow. Okay. That's cool. That's very cool. How, wait, wait, what, what year did you graduate, Troy? 85. Okay. And, and uh, you, Miss Ma'am? She's still in high school, I think. Oh, you'll yeah. never know. Next year for Trent. <laughs> yeah, I graduated in 1976. 
No. Was the year Neil was born. Yeah. Yeah, there you <laughs> Yeah, so that's when I graduated. Troy's my older brother, by the way. Yeah. Really? Okay, awesome. The chat room uh want to know if you have any um Lorenzo Lama stories. And a lot of them are saying that they love Renegade. Oh, uh, so not oh I have a Jesse the Body Ventura story. Oh, nice. So we'll on that episode, <laughs> huh? I said we'll take it. <laughs> okay. So I, I have I have a Le- Le- Lorenzo Lamas uh, uh, story as well. Um, but Jesse the Body Ventura. So we in the episode is my first TV show, uh, episodic wise, and it was me and Jesse the Body we were the Butler brothers. And he, and he, and this is how bad the uh, the the, uh, the dialogue was. I'm sitting in a car. We're both drinking. You should you probably can find video of it somewhere. We're both drinking and we're planning, you know, how we're going to uh, uh, like get his ex-wife back or whatever. Right. I guess the wife's wife is now with Lorenzo or something. like that. I don't know. I guess. And so I turned to Jesse and I go, we go back there. <laughs> Man, we're definitely going to stir up some major bas- badness. Not to mention hellacious trouble. I'm like, really? That kind of dialogue, hellacious badness. Who says that? <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, but he is funny. Uh, he's he's a pretty cool, dude. And you know, later on, he becomes uh, uh, the the governor of, of uh, Minnesota. Yeah. But um, Lorenzo Lamas, I did a film with him after all that, and it was called CIA Codename Alexa, with Lorenzo Lamas, his wife at the time, Kathleen Kenmont, and O.J. Simpson. So. Um, <laughs> And this is before he killed his wife, of course. And and so uh I don't want to lie, I shouldn't laugh at that. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, I was for that film, I was just supposed to do this fight scene with Lorenzo Lamas. And then so this is one of these films where the director goes, Hey, that was a pretty good fight scene. Okay, say this dialogue. Hey, you're pretty good. So they wrote this whole thing. Next thing I'm the fourth lead in the film with single card billing it was awesome. But the fight I had with Lorenzo, we're doing this thing, doing this thing, or fighting and fighting, fighting, and and it's down like in this meat packing plant but down the like the under the whatever the wall of pipes are at this meat packing plant and lorenzo bam just freaking buries a fist right into me and poof, and i'm like and i also like poof, i snap on him and i'm looking at him he's like hey dude and i'm thinking this is a real thing now so i'm ready to freaking take, take his head off because i'm a pretty good fighter right so uh and I studied martial arts and things like that. And so, and plus being an you know, athlete, you know, from football and things like that, I, I'm pretty quick. And uh, people think that because I'm a big dude, like 6'4", 270 pounds, I can't move, but I'll, I can get on you in two seconds, you know? And, uh, and so he was like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But he was, he was really cool. Lorenzo runs a great guy. Uh, yeah. I've had, uh, you know, uh, just really cool dude really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um- how about uh, so? Did you do a lot, uh, most of your own stunts and fight work in the movies? Um, yeah, most all the fight stuff is all me, of course. Um, there are some things like uh, when I was on Charm for two years, and so for Charm to play Belthazor, there was a, car- a guy by the name of Tim Sitars. Like his nickname is Bubba, and he looks a lot like me as big guy, kind of bald head. Um, he played football like I did, so he would do. He was a, he's a legit stunt guy, and. Uh, he would all do the ratchets, you know, yanking you with a out of it with a big cable out of a window. And there's a couple of times he t- took some falls for me and I got him in some movies. I got him like when I was in uh, doing uh, Men in Black 2. Uh, I don't know if you saw that where I get eaten yeah. by Laura Flynn Boyle and, and she takes me, you know, goes with a big belly behind her. Oh, uh, no. She drags me in the bushes and all of a sudden I, I go up in the air. That's that's his legs. They, they didn't want me up hanging upside down for half an hour so. Yeah, pretty funny. For for the for fight scenes, is that something like uh, you had an you had a knack for? Or is is that something you have to go to school t- to uh, learn to do? I well, two things. First, you got to do some acting in it, right? Um, you know, you have to be in the character. And secondly, you have to be safe. And there's a couple times that I've mistakenly skinned somebody. You know, like got a little close or you know things like that. But you know, normally if you're shooting something from perspective, like if you're in front of me, you throw a punch, like right here, I go, like, go, like you, you can't tell how close, how far away I am or how close I am. Um, it takes that. You have to be careful, but you still have to be, uh, you have to make it look real, you know, mm-hmm. and you have to look like you know what you're doing. 
So when I first started doing like, you know, movie fighting, I wasn't very good. And then I studied with a martial arts guy named uh, Philip Tan, great guy, great stunt coordinator, uh, now a great producer. Um, and he taught me like every, everything. So it's really cool. I've got to fight Urkel in Family Oh, Matters. very I mean, good. How, how yeah. cool is that? He it. No. Yeah. Did he <laughs> do that? Yeah. Did uh, any injuries on set in any of the fight scenes? Yeah. Um, uh, when I was, uh, yeah, a ton of those. I broke my nose and split my head open in Bulgaria uh, fighting uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Uh, so that and then he kicked me in the balls about three or four times. So that was always good. And then um, I tore my bicep off. I oh, fully wow. detached it from a movie called uh, A Chain Letter. Played the uh, lead bad guy in that. And I didn't tell anybody about it. So it was like on the first take, I tore my bicep off and I just, and then I'm like, you know, that's a major injury, right? Your, your bicep yeah, gets ripped off so here. Good. And yeah, the end of it's up in my shoulder, you know, oh. and it was pretty painful. And I just, it's the first take. Uh, and so I went over and sat down and just like, this kind of hurts a little bit. <laughs> And then the stunt coordinator comes. Stunt coordinator comes over and goes, "Hey, did you just tell your tear your bicep? Because I heard it pop." And I go, "Yeah." And he goes, "He goes, uh, do you want to get the medical?" I said, "No, I don't want anybody to know about this. They pay me way too much money, and I'm 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 gonna suck it up." And so for the rest of the film, I I did it. I had to do. I had to pull chain letter, yank people around, do all this stuff. Pull a guy up through a ceiling with a torn bicep, and I just had the makeup effects guy paint because it it would bleed that it was bleeding internally so it was draining down into my hand and my arm it was turning my head arm all black and blue and so they just they put makeup on it make it covered it up wow. that's how i got away with it is it how did it he did it heal okay once you know the movie's over no, and no i had to get a surgery so i'll show you that uh, see can you see the can see the scar right yeah. there my arm yeah. right here so it's right there tore that right up yeah it's pretty nasty oh so Anyway, <laughs> any lingering like effects from that? For Besides, this, you know, look, yeah, yeah. The, the bicep is. I used to have like twenty-one inch arms, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, just craziness, you know, big old dude. Now my arms are still pretty big, but not like they used to be. So, but yeah. You never hurt yourself in football. You waited till you were in the movies. No, I, I yes. no, I blew my mm -hmm. I blew my knee out in football. Oh. So, um, with the Cowboys, and then before that, I got a scar here. On my chin, I my helmet came off during the kickoff, and I tackled a dude without my helmet and blew. I blew his ass up though. And then I went, I went on the sideline, and I go, man, I missed. I, I, I don't know. But can you cuss in this show? Yeah, know. yeah, it's oh, yeah. Okay, so I said, man, I fucked that dude up. I fucked him up. And he goes, you're crazy. And I said, I'm okay. And he goes, no, your freaking chin is like wide open because you know your chin's pulled across here. And so they just put a pad on it, and I played the rest of the game. And then I had like 21 stitches here. And then this right here. My front two teeth went through my lip. Here, I tackled a dude without a helmet. And this one, and then my front two teeth went through that. And that's about it. So that's not enough. Too bad. Yeah, you know, I, I tell everybody. I said, listen, my body is pretty torn up. And I said, so when I'm dead and I'm laying on the slab, and the and the doctor's looking over there, going, you know what? That dude wore his body out. It, it's not going to look good. So that's for sure, right? So that's it. <laughs> uh, on that note, Tristan, do you have a question? <laughs> um, well, my question was, what are what are the best and worst parts of acting for you? But uh, but maybe you just described the worst. I don't know. <laughs> oh no, that's that's not no that that's not uh, the best parts are. I think actually doing a scene. And getting so lost in the scene and becoming that character that you discover like cool and new things, and and then you get done and you're like, and they call cut. You you're like you you're like blinking or, and you're like, holy shit, what just happened? You just don't know. And all of a sudden you've done some magic. You know you've done something that's just really cra crazy and incredible. Maybe whatever you did. And then like the worst thing is sitting around and waiting. That's that's the worst thing. You know, I, doing that or or when it's like freaking freezing cold. And for me, because I was a big guy, it's either my shirts off or I'm wearing a tank top and it's like 20 degrees outside. I did a movie called um, Spy Mate. So from the producers that did uh, like uh, Air Bud, you know, those movies, Air Bud movies yeah. and think you know, dogs that play basketball and all those things like that. Right. So 
So this is one about it's about a, a spy whose partner is a chimpanzee. And so I, we shot this in Vancouver. We shot this in Jamaica and some sort of San Diego, a bunch of places. And it was really cool. Um, but we had a part that was where this is crazy. This is a great thing about acting. Uh, we were up in uh, in Vancouver in a, uh, a mountain called Hemlock. Really great. Uh, and and there at Hemlock is where they remember in um, what's the name of the movie? Oh, a blood sport. No, no, I'm sorry. First blood. Was uh you know the Rambo, Rambo film yeah, the, first the part Rambo. where he's walking away and he's walking across that bridge you know oh, he's yeah, stopped yeah. by the cop that whole thing is shot in the Hemlock and so we oh. went there and we went up in the mountains I spent like two weeks up there learning how to ride a snowmobile and you know I had my bald head it's funny my head doesn't get cold and you know when it's like that so I had a snowsuit on and learned how to ride, ride a uh, snowmobile like for two weeks it was awesome so but I I think being cold I did a I did a commercial with Tim McGraw and Tug McGraw, Bud Light commercial. And my butt cheeks are like just shaking. And then like <laughs> someone goes, hey, do you need like a blanket? Hell yeah, I need something. I'm freaking freezing. So you know when you're cold, when your butt cheeks are shaking. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, bong, bong Donkey in the chat, he wants to know if, um, if you're an MMA fan. I am. I'm a, a big MMA fan. I, I was... Listen, I I paid paid per view at the beginning. Like I saw the first one. I did too. I, yeah. I, I, all of them, man. I, I did all those. I am I like uh yeah. So I studied MMA. Like when I shot when I uh, shot the film uh, in Hell with Van Damme, I studied with the Machados in 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 uh, out of Santa uh, Santa Monica. I learned how to ground fight pretty well. I mean, I, I trust me. I'm a I'm a, a what do you call a foe act foe fighter. So I'm, right. <laughs> I mean, in real life, I might run, but you know, I make it look good, but yeah, I get to learn, you know, grappling and it was really cool. Yeah. I'm a big fan. Big yeah. fan. Uh, what's John Claude Van Damme like? Huh? Um, well, you've heard some of the stories. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he works hard, works really hard. Uh, I didn't like it that he broke my nose at the end of the end of the, uh, the movie. I, um, I can understand that. Yeah. Yeah. He, I, I became a, I think, I don't, I think I have suspicions on why he broke my nose. And, and I you think he did it on purpose? purpose? I think he did it on purpose. But, you know, um, but listen, a great guy. Uh, funny story, if we have time for this, funny story. I read for I read for three films for him. The first one I read was with a director named Ringo Lamb. Not Ringo Lamb. No. It was, I know what director I forgot. I forgot the name of the film it was. I went in, it was, it was at Universal, I think it was. I went in to read. He goes, you're great. You're great. This is why I had hair and it was slicked back. He goes, but you're too good looking. I'm like, really? He goes, you're too good looking. He goes, Von Damme's not going to like you. I'm like, all right. So he goes, come in. When you come in next week to read for him and me, don't shave. You know, come in messed up, whatever. So I did. I walk in. He's going, you're too good looking. What are you doing? I don't want him. And I'm like, damn. So I didn't get to do anything. So then, um, let's say a year later, he's doing that desert film. I forgot the name of it. So I, my manager calls him and goes, hey, got this, a Bon Tom film. I'm like, you know, the guy doesn't like me. I know, but it's going in anyway. Now you're bald headed. No, I wasn't bald headed. I was still in here. He said, go in. So um, I uh, go in and read, and it's with uh, I think the director's Appleby. He was the guy who directed the Rocky, I guess it was, something like that. And I read in, and I had to play this crack dealer or crack attic or something like that. So I did a great job. It was, it was good. And he says, you're great. You're great. I said, thank you. I appreciate that. But I'm just telling you right now, he doesn't like me. He goes, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I said, all right. So then he calls the manager like a few days later. He goes, what does Von Damme have against Michael? I said, I, she says, I don't know. So I didn't get that role. So now let's flash forward um, a couple years later, a few years later. By this time I'd done charm, I'd shaved my head. And so I no, now I have a new look. Went from first half of my career was with hair. Then now I'm bald headed. My wife just had the second, sec, our second baby. We're in the freaking maternity ward with, you know, post, post uh, having baby bliss. And she's holding the baby. And then my manager calls me. She goes, hi, I know this is really a sensitive time, but you have an audition. And I'm like, really right now? And then she goes, yeah. And then um, I turned to my wife and she goes, she goes, you need to go because you need to work. And so um, I went to the audition is for a Bondon film and and I walked in 
with bald head, he did not recognize me, nothing. I did a great job and I'm getting the role. I'm in Bulgaria. I'm having dinner with the whole cast. He's sitting next to me, he goes, Michael, why do you look so familiar? I know you. I go, no, we never met before. No, not once. Don't know who you are. <laughs> so no one hardly ever knows that story. Yeah. So, and then uh, when we were supposed to pay the bill, he ran out. <laughs> but Jeez. anyway. Yeah. And I think he's probably doing okay for himself. He didn't have to. Run yeah, out I don't know. So he yeah. disappeared. So yeah. it was funny. Oh. We, shot that, we shot that in Bulgaria. And because of my bald head, there's a lot of neo Nazis there. And they all thought I was oh, a neo Nazi. Wow. I'm like, no, I'm not a neo Nazi. So pretty crazy. That's a weird question, but it came up in another interview I did once. Um, and he's and the actor, uh, I forget his name now, but he he was in uh he was in uh Mad Max. He plays the uh the uh, the head of the, the police department. But he said shaving his head helped his longevity in acting because it's harder to tell how old you are. I agree completely. I agree completely. Not only that, for me, because I have one I had here, and you know, I I'd always, I always get, because I, when I had the hair, I mean, I always get like, well, he's, he's too good looking for playing, for playing a bad guy or whatever like that. And not like, first of all, I don't know where you're freaking getting that from, but whatever. And then secondly, um, it just, the hair kind of, and I, you know, even though I wanted to be a leading man and do all that stuff, and even on my mirror and Trista, this is something that you have to, if you're, if you're any friends, you have to have visual you know, affirmations. And I put all my, in my crappy Hollywood apartment uh, mirror in my apartment, I put Michael Bailey Smith, Hollywood's new leading man. That was on my bathroom, uh, bathroom mirror. And I did, I look at it every day. It's like when I played football, there was a guy ahead of me. His name is Don Doan. I put in my car, beat Doan's ass. That's <laughs> what I want to do. I want to beat him. And I'm, it was, that was kind of embarrassing because one time after practice, I gave him a ride home and he goes, what's going on with that? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, I said, actually, I had to scramble. I said, well, actually, that should be a compliment because I want to beat you out. I said, he goes, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. So, yeah. but, but, uh, so I put the um, thing on there and that's what you have to do is the affirmation. So, but I, you know, the way my career is going, you know, I played a lot of guys with the hair slicked back and then with the charm thing where I had to shave my head, it just opened up a whole new thing. I mean, now I can play skinheads and neo-Nazis and the crazy thing is, when I was in, uh, I was doing a movie called Undisputed with the Bing Rames and Wesley Snipes in Las Vegas. And I had a big, huge swastika on the back of my head. And I had, I was, I was sleeved and tattooed and all this Neil, uh, Aryan Brotherhood stuff, 666s six, six, on my, uh, or ABs on my hands and 666, six, all this stuff all over me. Uh, so I was training at this gym outside of the hotel. I put us up at the Caesars Palace like for two months, whatever, right? And that's, I can't walk around with a swastika on my head, right? And they put these tattoos that last for like weeks, right? All right. And so um, I'd wear a beanie and then I'd wear like these high collared shirts. I had like SSS stuff on here and I did all that stuff, right? And uh, uh, I went to this gym and I was working out, sweating my butt off. I'm like, man, I, I, so I took the beanie off, wiping my brow. People were looking at me and I put the beanie back on. <laughs> And then I finished my workout and then I walked outside and two Vegas PD cop cars pull up, <laughs> block me. They pull out their guns. They, they hooked me up, meaning they handcuffed me, threw me against the hood. I'm like this. And the first thing they asked me, what school do you go to? I'm like, what? He goes, I he goes, what school do you go to? Motherfucker? I said, I went to Eastern Michigan. No asshole. What prison? I'm like, well, I didn't know school meant prison. Uh. <laughs> and then, so they proceeded to tell me, you know, you got why, why you got your colors on all this stuff like that. I'm like, ah, no, well, hold it, hold it. I'm an actor. I'm doing this film with Bing Rames, Walsh Snipes. And, and I said that uh, these are just tattoos. And I said, officer, go ahead. And so he scraped off one of the A's and then he hooked me and turned me around. And I, he's like a little short cop. And he turned around and he goes, you better co you know, you, you, um, you better cover that shit up here when, when you're in Vegas or, you know, you and I are going to be having some issues. I'm like, all right, whatever. So then I got back. So the next day I show up in the set and the makeup effects lady goes, what happened to your tattoo? Why is it scraped off? And I'm like, so I told, I said, well, I, you know, that helped tell the whole story about the, the yeah. cop thing. And later on, uh, so Walter Hill's a director, right? So pretty, he did like, you know, uh, 
48 hours and things like that, right? With all that stuff. So yeah, I'm getting ready to do this uh, scene and Michael, and he walks up and he goes, hey, Michael. So I hear you ran into a little bit of trouble downtown. I go, yeah. I said, I almost got arrested. And he goes, you know what? That's good casting. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so, so that's what happened. So uh, that's all I got out of him. Well, I'm glad, so, glad he was pleased. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just got arrested. So there's, there's been things like that's happened quite a bit. Um, where when I got when I finished that film, I was in South Central. I had to do some, I had to go drive through there and I got out. I was in the, somewhere and there's all these dudes going, hey man, what are you doing here? I'm like, no, no, hold on. No, I'm not no neo-Nazi. I'm not no white, white supremacist or skinhead. That's just uh, me. Crazy thing. I did a movie called Best of the Best Three. All right. It's it's pretty cool. And I played a neo-Nazi guy. Uh, white. Uh, and so we did this, you know, you've seen a rock quarry, right? So it's got the water in the, in the middle. And it's got like on one side, it's a big, huge cliff. And they got all these locals. Why? It was shot in Bedford, Indiana. Unbeknownst to me and a lot of everybody, the Ku Klux, the Ku Klux Klan dragon master dude was born there and raised there. So it's it's pretty racist area. I have never in my life seen such blatant racism in my entire life. Uh, and that's a whole different story. But they had all these extra background people there from the town uh, on the rim of the of the quarry. And so we shot the scene of killing this this black preacher with a baseball bat, you know, pretty, pretty uh, dramatic and. They said, all right, break. We're going to go to lunch. So I'm walking to lunch and a couple of the local guys go, hey, man. With you, white power. I'm like, what? <laughs> white, what do you mean white power? No, like, oh, man, because I had these tattoos, the white power tattoos. He goes, no, man. I said, dude, no, stop. I said, first of all, get the get the fuck away from me. Mm. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> that's not what I do. I'm an actor. This is bullshit. You know, so anyway, it's pretty funny. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, so crazy. I uh, you mentioned earlier uh, playing Pluto in uh, the Hills of Eyes. Um, well, first of all, how did that come about? How did how did you get involved in the Hills of Eyes? That was just a straight up audition, right? So that's what it was. I was put on tape. Uh, I read for Mary uh, Mary Magdalena. I read for, actually, yeah. So that's what I read for. Actually, the uh, what's the, the role? The guy with the mouth kind of jacked up. I forgot the name of it, but anyway, um, you know, I'm talking about that character. Yeah, um, I know the movie and, well because they had more dialogue, right? So, mm. and I did that, and then they said that we want you to play Pluto. I said, "Great, and that's how it happened." And then Alex Aja uh, called me and said, "Do do not watch the original. Mm. This is this is going to be different. Yeah. It still, it's kind of similar but different. Don't, I don't want you to be influenced." I said, "All right," so I didn't. And uh, next thing you know, I got went to KMB, which is a great makeup effects house, and they, uh, you know did all the prosthetics and then sent all that stuff over to, to Alex, who was, he was in France at the time. He's French. And then flew me out to, uh, uh, flew me out to Morocco. So the, the, the first stop for you, when you fly from Los Angeles, you go to France. So and I was there in France. And then from there, I went to uh, Casablanca, you know, so I'm like, wow, you know, kind of a cool place. Oh, yeah. And it's like an eight hour w- uh, wait. Um, uh, in Casablanca. So they had a PA waiting for me. And he said, where do you, where do you want to go to lunch? And it was during Ramadan also. So Ramadan is like a, you know, very religious a Muslim, you know, it's a whole thing where you can't eat. It's a fasting situation. It's funny when Ramadan ends at sunset that the whole world comes alive. It's like everybody comes out of their, their, the houses and everybody's eating and things like that. Well, we were walking around and we went to a bazaar, like an open air market. And I already did the Hill, I already did the Van Damme film and I didn't know how big Van Damme is around the world. You know, you kind of know, but you don't know and just how powerful uh, movies are around the world. Um, and I was walking in this open air market and someone goes, Jean-Claude Van Damme, <laughs> you, you were in the Jean-Claude Van Damme film. <laughs> Next thing you know, this huge, huge group of people start chasing me and the driver's going, we got to go. <laughs> so that was pretty cool but yeah so i went to uh we flew into there then went to a place called uh, marrakesh flew a uh, uh, stop over marrakesh and went right to a, a town called warzazat and they, and they always tease and say it's where's it where's it at for where's it at pretty much because it's at the freaking bottom of the uh of morocco next to sahara desert 
it is the most desolate place that I've been to. There is not every rock that ever wanted to go on vacation or ends up there. There's no sand. It just rocks, made a little bit of sand and there's no plant life, no nothing. Just crazy. Um, and they put us up at this pretty nice hotel area. You know, it's a very um, Middle Eastern, uh, like the kind you would see in Casablanca, right? That kind of, that kind of uh, hotel. And so we filmed that and it was a, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, I did the second one as well, the sequel, yeah. and I played Papa Hades. Mm -hmm. And when I went a year later, and so not knowing how well I did on the first one, even though I won the award uh, on that, you know, the, the effect of that, when I went to the, to the, the cafeteria in the studio, the cafeteria is huge. It has probably 40, 50 foot walls with a ceiling on it. It's huge. And where right there on the big ass wall is a huge picture of Pluto that someone painted on the wall. Wow. That's pretty badass. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. So, um, had you done a, um, like that much heavy makeup before that movie? Before playing Pluto? Yeah. I mean, of course, think about well, it. I did, Freddy, uh, you did yeah, a lot. Freddy, I did Star Trek. Um, I did uh, Babylon 5. Um, and I did Charmed, of course, for a couple years. You know, I did that. So either, you know, uh, the, um, I don't call it spray painting, but, you know, the, either that kind of the, or through the prosthetics, you know, so yeah. KMB was really great because they allowed the prosthetics to be very malleable. So I could really act through that. So it could show a lot of like subtle subtleties in the acting, which is good. What was it like wearing that uh, in Morocco though? I assume it's very hot. Yeah, it's desert. like 110, 120. And so, yeah. It's crazy. Uh, you, I remember the, the opening of that where I kill mm -hmm. the, 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 the minor dudes are out there doing Geiger counter stuff. So they, where they put the prosthetics on or in one area, and then we had to drive like 10, 15, 20 miles to another area for, to, get that des to a desolate area for that, even more desolate. So they just threw me in a regular car and I was a Moroccan guy. And I'm like a little Jeep, you know, and we're driving along. I'm in the front seat, full on in Pluto. Uh -huh. And we, we go through this small town and there's like these all the sheep herders going by over the sheep and he's going, and he stops, looks at me, screams, throws his staff up in the air, runs off into the hills. So, you know, come on. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so it's pretty cool. But I'll tell you one thing was really, was really incredible when, um, when uh, we were shooting that scene, I could, we were like between takes and they were setting up, I could hear Meh like this little, these like, like sheep bang. And so I went over this ridge and literally this is straight out of like, uh, you would see from a Moses movie or out of the Bible and the picture, there was, uh, there was these sheep herders and a full on, you know, outfits uh, with their staffs herding the sheep across this, mount this mountain face. And it was so incredible. It just, it was just a beautiful time. Just, it was incredible. It was great to do that film. Again, you know, I've been all over the world filming, you know, um, just pure, uh, solely, you know, purely blessed. I am so good stuff. Uh, when you come back for the sequel as Papa Hades, and you're someone who you know, you talked about, you know, finding a, you know, not this isn't just a role. It's you're not just this big monstrous guy. So how how do you differentiate the two? Like you obviously don't want to play him exactly how you play Pluto. Okay, it's like anything, like the Charmed, right? That's that's the part about, I guess, you know, hopefully you have enough talent or you know you know, I guess sense about you to know that you can't play the same thing. Right. And plus mm -hmm. the totally, two to totally different characters. Papa Hades is in charge. Right. Where Pluto mm -hmm. was just uh, basically a minion an innocent, you know, you, you, you could have taken Pluto and put him with a normal family in the United States. He even wrote, you know, he'd been kind of scary to look at, but a nice goofy guy. Right. But he was raised with a bunch of cannibal cannibalists and, you know, and uh, he was, you know, eating people. The product of his eating. environment. Yeah. Yeah, agreed completely. Um, but uh, for Hades, I mean, he's just different. And it's kind of cool about that that character. You know, I went to Wes Craven and I said, hey, um, you know, I this guy, you know, because they, they they just called me and gave it to me, the role. It, I didn't have to reach for that at all. Said so, Mary Matt, uh, Magdalena, who was the producer, says, Mike, did a great job on first one. We want you for the second one. We want you to play this character. And so, but I went to Wes and I said, uh, and the director, I said, hey, I, 
these guys are inbred over years and years and years, right? So there's got to be biologically or genetically things wrong with them, right? So besides him just being a big, tough guy, um, how about he has something more than that? So that's all that, that all that mucus coming out of my mouth. And that was kind of my idea. That was my idea. They actually took the alien ooze and painted it like snot color and then uh, did that. And so that was like a lot of like, you know, things are like I was coughing up stuff because my lungs were infected. The crazy thing is that um, Danielle, got her last name, uh, Daniela, um, she played one of the soldiers that I end up, it's always difficult to do is I had to basically rape that girl, right? And I threw her on the table and on top of her and I'm on top of her, I go, and I go, you give me baby, you know, that part. And then um, when I'm doing that, some of that stuff came out of my mouth and went right into her mouth. And I felt so bad. And she goes, we got to keep going. <laughs> she was a trooper. She didn't quit. So she was awesome. So good. And it's funny, uh, the producer, when I show up in the second movie, Mary, Mary Emmett, uh, Mary Magdalene, she goes, uh, uh, Marianne, there's a name, Marianne. Um, I think I'm pronouncing her last name right, but wrong. But Marianne, she goes, um, Michael, so the guys that are playing the um, uh, the soldiers, I don't think they're going to be scared of the of you guys at all. So when you get, when you show up, she called me. She goes, when you show up, I want you to scare the shit out of them. I don't want you. I want you to be. I don't want you to be nice to them. I want you to be nasty and just mean to them, like with or without. She goes, just all the time. Really. So I remember the first day I, I get, I'm the first one in the, in the van ready to go to the set. And then here comes all the actors of the plane and soldiers are all pretty. And, and then Dan- Danielle goes, hi, how are you? I'm Danielle. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's all I said. And then I would take, she's like, wow, this guy's kind of, a, you know, but I scared him. So it was good. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that before. Uh-huh. I've done that before. I, I don't know if you want to hear this story. Um, yeah, of course. Um, I did a I did a movie called uh, The Truth About Beef Jerky. <laughs> so I know this is shot up in like close to Big Sur, and it's about this Seven uh, Eleven store which I'm the manager of, and I send these people down the road. It's kind of like Hills of Eyes, and they get and they get chopped up and made into beef jerky. It's the best beef jerky in the in the in the area, the country. And really so they they hired they wanted these hippies to come in and like and. And the head hippie was like an actor. The rest of them were all extras. They wanted to do this whole thing. Well, they hired like local, you know, hippie, hippie people. <laughs> and they had the van. Really, they had the flowered van. The host, They were like right out of, you know, casting, you know, pretty crazy. And so when we were doing this scene. I'm the store manager and I'm supposed to, you know, I'm intimidating. And we're doing this thing. They're supposed to be intimidated. Well, they're in the back laughing and joking and the director getting mad. So they cut for lunch. And I felt so bad about this. Uh, they cut for lunch and, and uh, the director comes up, me, comes up to me and goes, hey, Michael, listen, those, uh, those guys the, the gals, they're not, uh, they're not getting this, man. They're, they're not into the scene. They're just not doing anything. It's killing it. Can you go there and scare the shit out of them? I said, really? I said, yes, go up there and just scare the shit out of them. I said, go just freaking say some mean stuff to them. So I go, all right, so... <laughs> it's lunchtime. There's like a whole group of women, like in a semicircle, and this guy's playing a guitar. Literally, it's like freaking out of you would see out of a whatever. And uh, I walk up to him and I go, and I just start staring at him. And all of a sudden, they go, they, one guy stops playing guitar. Goes, "Hey man, what's going on?" I go, "What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. You guys stink. When's the fucking last time you took a bath?" I just went off on them about, oh, I see you're sucking off the government. Look at you coming home, sitting in front of Christmas time and your mom's going, hi, this is my son, the fucking hippie. I mean, I just went off on them bad, like really bad. I had them crying, feeling bad. And so when we did the scene again, they were scared shitless. But I felt so bad. I was like, so <laughs> right, I, right. Yeah. I apologized after I said, hey, let's, let's let you guys know that I'm not like this that the director made me do this and <laughs> then they started laughing but yeah uh, Tristan, do you have another question oh do you have a favorite horror film well 
what's near and dear to my heart. Well, my first one I ever saw was a movie you've probably never seen before. It's called Count Yorga Vampire. I know that, was, that was I was like 15 years old or whatever. It was like some old cheesy film that got that got me into that. That's pretty cool. But I think um, the first Nightmare on Elm Street um, that that scared the shit out of me. That was awesome. Um, and then then of course um, I love like a film that I was in. Like I love the, the Hills of Eyes. I love that film. Character wise, I love that. Also, uh, Monster Man. If you get a chance to see Monster Man, you got to find him. It, my character and the way I move and walk and talk, it's really great. It's good. It's it's got it's kind of kind of seventy horror film to it. I, listen, I play a I drive a monster truck and run over people. <laughs> it's freaking how much awesome can you get from that? My character's name is Fuckface. Come yeah. on. <laughs> so all good yeah. stuff. Yeah, we're we're all gonna find. Uh, oh yeah, you have me sold on just the character's name. I didn't even know, <laughs> need to know what the movie was about. Yeah, right. and uh, you know, you mentioned Hills of Eyes. It it is considered one of the best uh, remakes. You know, we live in a world where people look down on remakes, but that that's always one that's considered one of the one of the best ones. Yeah, you know, it's funny when that came out. You know, you I like watching. I like reading some of the reviews, and then when they mention me or whatever like that, they go. Michael Bailey Smith will never be uh, Michael Berryman. I'm like, it's a totally different character. You know, it's a, it's not even the same. And then uh, I did a autograph signing. I think it was in Amsterdam. And I met Michael at the airport. And we had a long, long layover. So we went and had dinner. And he is, I'll tell you, man, he is just the, the nicest freaking coolest dude. Yeah. He is so cool. Yeah. He's super mellow. Just a very nice guy. Oh, he is. He's great. Yeah. I agree. Clearly. Did you end up watching? Uh, you know, they told you not to watch it. Uh, the original Hills of Eyes at the time, but did you watch it since then? Yeah, I did. I did. I did. It, it, it was fine. It was. It was. It was great. But you know, I'm glad I didn't watch it. So, yeah. So, because I just came from a fresh perspective and it was my own oh, spin yeah. on you know the, the character and it was cool. So yeah. Yeah. Um, how about you? You know, you mentioned doing like a, a convention in Amsterdam. Uh, when you started doing the the convention scene, uh, what was that like? And did you you know realize that people were so into these characters that you played? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I did like when, when I did the Hills of Eyes, um, that's when I started doing doing that. Um, I think I, I did a couple when I did you know the Fantastic Four. You know, I did a couple of those just because for promotional purposes. But um, and we didn't make any money from mom that we just did it to sign autographs right it was all for free and then the hills of eyes i had a couple i had bill phil put and uh and uh uh clark dan, dan uh dan sean clark, dan clark. Sean dan clark. clark. i think it's sean yeah, yeah sean clark sean they're, clark they phil, they were, now but yeah yeah when they, when they were together so uh -huh. yeah so that's then they approached me and said hey you know you should, you should you'd be good at this and so uh did that and uh yeah and uh, it was a fun ride. I did it for a while, but I kind of burned out a little bit from it. Um, I, I don't know. And and now I'm with uh, with Stellar Appearances. So I, I haven't done it in over 10 years, probably 10 or 15 years. I have not done a show, maybe 10 years, 10 or 12. And so I'm doing the first one um, next Saturday, next Friday, oh, Saturday, wow. Sunday. Cool. I'll be at the Days of the Dead, which is the Bill Philpott show. Yeah, I was so, just gonna say you're back with Bill Phil. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, with with uh, Peter, the guys at uh, Stellar Appearances, so they approached me and said, "Hey, you want to do shows again?" I said, "Yeah, I did it in a while." So, that's where's what that I'm one? Doing. At? Is that in Chicago? In Chicago. Chicago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I've done show Days up? of the Den. I've done Days of the Den in Chicago. I hosted the, the panels there at a good time. Yeah. I like Chicago in general. Yeah, traffic's kind of crazy, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah good stuff are you a big uh a thing fan i am but uh troy is the big comic book fan here okay good huge fan so, and trista what, what's your what are you a big fan of oh i like horror <laughs> yeah <laughs> are you an actress mm -hmm. you are good <laughs> Wait, have you been in some stuff yeah i do horror i do indie horror oh that's awesome that's awesome yeah that's uh that's not an easy road, man. It's late nights and not a lot of pay and, you know, but it's, you know, if, if you really love it, man, it's just, it's just great. Congratulations, you know, so. 
She's it's great. Tough. She she won't she doesn't like to talk about herself too much, but she's great. And uh I would we'd recommend Purgatory Road and uh, Echoes okay. of Fear. And she's got a lot of new stuff coming out. I like it. Echoes like of it. Fear is tremendous. You can see that on I think it's on What's Shutter, it called? isn't it? What's it uh, called? Echoes of Fear. Okay. All right. And 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 Tr- uh, Trisha, uh Trista, where are you based out of? Uh, LA. LA, okay. All right. Well, you're already there that you were asking me. You're... I wasn't asking for me. I was asking for audience. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your wisdom. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, you can share the same wisdom. You know the you know the same road, and I think what I what I say speaks the truth, right? Um, Absolutely. You have to get yourself established. If you're living out of your car, which I did for a while, or trying to scrape in to find a you know something to eat, it's tough to try to audition at the same time. So you need to get the get your personal life squared away then you get your professional life those are the two things you need to get done and you got both have to yeah, marry probably in that order successful. too huh probably in that order i would imagine yeah personal life first <laughs> yep. being job you know well-being and like, like i said before um someone told me this is that you know you have to act and dress and treat yourself like you're successful and you will be because so you walk into audition desperate they're going to smell that a mile away. You have to walk in like I'm professional. And that's, it's a treat this as a professional job. And that's what, when I started acting at the beginning, I started with a lot of, a lot of big dudes, you know, that were all six, four and two seventy, whatever, 300 pound guys, big muscular dudes. Um, and these guys never studied. And I studied my ass off and I, and I always went to, and I was, I had, a, I had a, like my secret weapon was I'd go to an acting coach beforehand to, before audition, especially it was a big role. I would go to an acting coach and I'd pay them, you know, I'd pay them whatever the hourly rate I'd go for an hour and work that scene, work that audition piece uh, to where I was, I had it nailed. And so then, you know, half an hour later, I'm in front of the casting director and I freaking nail it. So, and, and, and Tristan knows about that. So that's, that's was my secret weapon. I always found a good acting coach and it could be another actor. That's maybe not a competition with you. That's what you have to do. Maybe, you know, whatever, that you read off of that works the scene and it'll tell you honestly if this sucks or not. And then that's how, that's how I did it. I treat it just like a job. So, and that's how I have to do it. So. And uh, you said you're writing now currently. Yes, sir. I just finished a, I, uh, there's a movie called my good boy that I, uh, wrote and got optioned and it's going to go into production next year. A guy by the name of David Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffries, um, who is the producer on it, he's done. Uh, he's produced TV shows like uh, Bones, uh, Queen of the South, a uh, bunch of shows. So, Prison Break, and so yeah, it's based in Detroit. It's based in the 1980s. So, and it's about it's a little got a little bit of a personal touch to it. Um, it's about my time after the Cowboys. You know, there's all these sports stories about, you know, these athletes who you know, overcome all these great odds, become all these great odds to become the successful athlete, right? But they never tell the story about the guy who blew his knee out and was left with nothing. What happened to that guy? So and that was me. There's a lot more of those stories, I would assume. You know, I agree. So and that that's me. So, you know, I've I've stared at a gun in my face. I've had, you know, it, we won't go down that road, but it's been, it was a crazy time. So it's that story. It's about some of that. What was that experience, what's that experience right to write about something like that, that is very personal to you? Well, I mean, it's, it's way fictionalized as well. Right. So mm-hmm. a lot of times real life is not as, not as exciting as, you know, what the movie life is. So, uh, but it's good. I mean, there's actually a lot of scenes in that movie that are, that happened that happened in real life, some funny scenes some scary things some actual dialogue that I actually said, you know, and there'll be someone else that'll be, I'm not in it. So, um, but it's, it's good. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. And sometimes you, it's as a writer, sometimes, and this is always, they always say, yeah, sometimes you have to kill your darling. So, you know, meaning there's some scenes that are just so cool, but they just don't work and you have to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. You know, the story is what, is what's the master, right? That's mm-hmm. what leads everything. So. Well, it's very exciting, though. I look forward to uh, to seeing yeah. this eventually. It's called My Good Boy, so it's based in Detroit. So hopefully, we shoot next year. So a year after that, we'll be out. So it'll be good. Yeah. 
So, uh, working yeah. on anything else currently? Uh, no, that I've been focusing on that. I've written about 10 screenplays right now. I have, mm-hmm. I have another one called uh, Dark Sun. Uh, and it's, you know, the dark sun, the planet, you know, brown dwarf star. It's a sci-fi film. Another one I've written called Black Moth. So it's a, uh, it's the, it's kind of, I like, you ever seen movies like Shawshank Redemption, things oh, yeah. like that. Oh, so, um, yeah, I, I like movies that kind of tell, have some meaning behind it a little bit. And, you know, then that one, I try to answer this, answer the never ending question. Why do bad things happen to good people? So, and then I've written a kind of a horror film called The Promise, which is kind of cool. So, yeah, some good stuff. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, uh, Trista. Yeah, did you have one more question, Trista? Um, what do you think? Uh, can you talk a little on the pros and cons of working on lower budget projects uh, versus bigger budget projects? <laughs> well, the the pros would be uh, the trailer, uh, <laughs> uh, craft service, <laughs> the the. Um, I, to me, making a movie is making a movie. You know, sometimes you have to sign up. You you know what you're getting into, right? So it's like, I know actors. One particular uh, person I know um, knew that he was going to be playing wearing prosthetics. That's what he signed up for. But then when we got into it, didn't want to do it. or freaked out. Sometimes, so it's like, if you sign up for something, you know what you're getting into, do it suck it up and do it same thing do, doing a, high, a big budget film or a lower budget film the same thing it's about making the movie it's about the story it's about your character i don't care if it's big small whatever it is i did a film short just a little while ago and uh and a uh, great director um it's called uh Mir- miracle desert i spent a weekend three days buried from the neck down in the Mojave Desert. Neck down in the Mojave Desert. So, and all my, and it was just me and this other character. G.R. Bourne was the other guy. We were this far, we're this close from each other the whole time. So if you you wanna, I don't know if you can, you can uh, Google Miracle Desert, go up images and find that. And and then you you can show it to everybody if you want to. That's, that's what I did. So that was a low budget film, but it, the dialogue was great. Great characters. Funny. I played this big kind of innocent dude who had, you know, who was still very, um, had a great character arc, very meaningful. It was really cool. So it's a great little film. So to me, big budget, you just get paid a little bit more maybe, but that's about it. Oh, you're going to share it? Good. Yeah, there you go. There you are right there. That's him. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, great, great little film. So, which is yeah. worse, the heat or the cold when you're on a movie? Oh, to me, the, the cold. The cold is, uh, especially for me, because I always end up wearing a tank top or I'm shirtless or something like that. And I can't, you can't, like, if it's the heat, I can take some, you know, it's okay. Right. But, when it's cold out, it's, it's tough to compete against that. So, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I get, uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the cold as I've uh, gotten older here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, where can people, uh, where can people follow you to see uh, what you're up to? Yeah, I have an old website that I need some, I need to blow away. I need to stop that one. That's bad because it's just old and uh, it's, uh, it cost me a lot of money to do that back in the day too. So, uh, I'm going to blow that away here shortly. Uh, but, um, you know, I guess it's weird how websites are starting to become a thing of the past. A lot of like uh, old websites, if you go to the, a lot of people's personal yeah. websites, they don't exist anymore. They agreed. Know. Agreed. Um, I guess Facebook, great way. I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm on Instagram too, I guess. I don't use that much. I'm, I'm, I'm not very savvy when it comes to some social media thing. So, but mostly Facebook is where it's not for you guys reach out to me through Facebook. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. So that's it, I think. Other than that, just send me, you can always send me an email at mbs at michaelbaileysmith.com. And that's it. And if you have any, we need some help or some advice, you know, on anything, um, 
I'm glad I'm sharing. You know, I've traveled. It's funny. I end up, I'm like a, <laughs> I know it's funny. Um, traveling all over the world, you know, in China, I've been in China probably 30 times. Um, and it's funny. People know me in China. That's crazy. They see my movies. Um, but uh, there's, they, they have Uber is DD. So Uber is called, is, it's called DD. And they're, they're in the United States and Amsterdam all over uh, taking Uber. And I end up getting these conversations with people um, regarding, you know, what do you plan on doing with your life and things like that. You know, I, I sometimes I always listen to these motivational videos and, and speeches and things like that from people. And one thing that really struck me, it says, you know, the, the place where you're going to find the greatest inventions, the cure for cancer, um, the ability to, to teleport into another universes is in the graveyard. Because the people who died had these great ideas were afraid to even execute on them. And that's it. So, you know, you got one life, this moment that we're having right now, you'll never get back. And every day you need, you, you need to make the most of it. You will not find, I mean, I have nothing against people playing video games, but you'll not find a video game on my, on my computer. I, I am not gonna spend time doing that. I'm gonna be pushing my, my career forward Either I'm writing or I'm doing something like that, or I'm, I'm figuring out a way with my, with my business, which I just quit my other job and I just jumped to a startup. Just crazy. So I, this is what I want to do, you know? And uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I tell people. Was there a moment uh, you, you got that mindset or was that something you've always had? I think it's something that mm, I, I get a little, hold on, I got a little teary eyed when I start talking about this. I'm a big baby. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm very passionate about everything that I do. Um, and even though I have lots of fun and I'm a big goofball, uh, like have, my wife thinks I'm two years old, which is awesome. You know, um, maybe not two, probably like 15, 15. <laughs> yeah. At least you could talk, you know, <laughs> I could <Yeah>. drive <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but, um, I just think it's through my life experiences that kind of just kind of grew into this, you know, I grew up being picked on and beat up in high school. I had, uh, no one knows this. And I'm going to tell you something pretty, pretty personal here, but I used to have ears that stuck way out, like way out. And so when I became an actor, uh, someone convinced me to have my ears pinned back. So I had bare my So no one knows that, but it's told you something that no one ever knows. My wife knows this, but it just, but the thing is I was picked on and beat up all the time. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, instead of, I use that as, as my driving force to prove people. Uh, and I was always called, I was stupid and dumb, you know? And, uh, and so I use those things to prove people wrong. I love it when someone tells me you can't do something. I love it when someone tells me, you know, you, you're terrible or you suck. I, I love that because it just pisses me off and I will figure out a way to uh, prove you wrong. I will devise a plan. I will execute on that plan and I will prove you wrong. So that's, but that's how, that's how it is. But I think everybody should be like that, right? Don't take that shit. Everybody's, everybody has their own special, uh, special talent and gift. They do. People say, Oh no, I don't No, Fucking you do. You do, man. So I'll get Let's say going back to the, the when we started the interview and you said, you know, after uh, Super Freddy and, and you go and uh, do an audition and they say basically they tell you to, you know, keep your day. I job. suck. Yeah. If yep. they didn't say that, you know, maybe it wouldn't you wouldn't have had the motivation to to do what you did. It's funny. Um, social media is pretty crazy. Um, and the fact that. It's funny, I when you become successful or like whatever, I guess I'm quasi successful or I've done some things. Right. So, but you get like ex-girlfriends calling you, hi, how are you? What's going on? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> there's a reason why we're, we're not together anymore. Yeah. I, I get that a lot from people I went to high school with that never <laughs> talked to me at all. And yeah, I'm not, they that, again, I'm not important, friend. but they'll see pictures with people. And then, yeah, yeah it's good. Oh, it's good. Right. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I remember one specifically. He used to lick his thumb and stick on my. I wore glasses and my glasses. Then he would message me like we were best friends, and I'm like, uh, no, we weren't friends at all. But, uh. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah I, it's yeah it's pretty crazy so yeah and it's funny um i remember when i was in high school this one guy uh is when, when i went to iran and finished my junior and senior year there it's more like my it was my middle school and my freshman and sophomore year so i was mostly picked on and um but it's funny and i don't know if this, if anybody else has experienced this but for me you know, when you go, I'm okay. I'm gonna go. I'm going to another country, right? I'm going to another halfway around the world, right? And I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start. A, I'm gonna. And that's why I thought, said to myself, I'm gonna. I'm gonna change my image. I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna get rid of this whole thing about being always picked on. I'm gonna change. So I go to the high school in Iran, and the same shit happened. It's like oh. I, I smelled like I smelled like you could be picked on, right? That's a freaking. It's like people this, can sense this, these things, yeah. Yeah, people can smell that shit on you, and that freaking pissed me off. So the way that that I can, that I, I prove people wrong is that through sports, I became a great athlete, and that's how I did it. I didn't go and you know beat up people and do anything. I just, just found something that I was good at, and just and just worked at it, and that's that's how I got. I guess you know I don't know. I, don't, I know I always want to. Everybody always wants to get respect, right? So. Um, and, and you have to do it through your deeds. So anyway. No, I think that's, I think there's a good message for everybody. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I speak for everybody. It's been really a pleasure to talk with you. You too. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. I, I got, got some tears in my eyes. I got <laughs> snot right on my nose. I'm good. So I think I'd be a good interview. <laughs> yeah. It's been excellent. And we're going to go see monster man. And we look forward you, to, uh, to the movies you're writing. Oh yeah. Good. I go ahead, sir. Please see Monster Man. You'll like it. I'm telling you. And then then email me and tell me how, how you like it. So I think well, indeed, like it. yeah. And but, and I don't know if you know this. This is our first uh show since we were accepted to Spotify video. Uh so you're gonna be the first guest on the on our Spotify uh video. Nice, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Good, congratulations. It's blown that's, up today with four thousand yeah, hits yeah. on Spotify. It's very exciting. Yeah, that's good. I'm I'm uh I'm happy for you guys, man. You guys are cool dudes, everybody, and cool gal. So, so. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank yes, you ma'am. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. No, thank you, guys. And and just you have a. I hope you wish you the a great career and keep going, man. Just keep going. Thank you. Yeah, you do it. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you, guys. We'll t- and right. thank you for guys. watching. Right. We will right. talk, we'll to, you talk next week. to you all next time. Yeah. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. Subscribe. Right. Hit the bell icon. All that stuff. <laughs> Good night. See you. See you, Neil. See you, Tristan. See you, Mike.